Last night, I got to go to the re-grand opening of the Egyptian Theater located right here in Hollywood, California. And let me just say, it looks gorgeous inside and out. Netflix dropped a bunch of money to restore this Hollywood landmark. And let me just say, they did a great job. The sound during the movie was fantastic. The outside and inside correlate with each other to make sure a cinephile has the perfect movie-going experience in one of the premier theaters in Hollywood. If you are in the Hollywood area, I highly recommend you check out the Egyptian Theater located right on Hollywood Boulevard. Now, we got a great Q&A done by Hollywood's own Jim Hemphill, who did a great job for the movie The Killer. I absolutely love this film. Michael Fassbender does a fantastic job balancing the preciseness of a killer with a little bit of humor that is peppered in throughout the film. David Fincher does a great job balancing everything and the atmosphere is created so perfectly with the soundtrack from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. So leave comments and let me know what you thought of The Killer after you saw it or let me know what your favorite David Fincher film is. In the meantime, here is the live Q&A from The Egyptian on Hollywood Boulevard featuring director David Fincher and sound designer Ren Kleiss as they discuss making The Killer. So, you know, one of the real pleasures of this movie for me was seeing you direct another great Andrew Kevin Walker script. And I was wondering if you talk a little bit about the origins of this and how the two of you came to work together on it again and what it was about the graphic novel that you responded to. Oh boy. Um, I, I responded to something that was this rigorous about its um, subjectivity. I hadn't seen, um, I mean, there's a lot of voiceover. I've made movies that have voiceover before. and um, But there was a kind of commitment to the being inside the eye sockets of this guy and I thought it might be a, a good test and, and, and also um, I like the idea of it seemed like if you were this dedicated to one specific POV that we could do without a lot of backstory a lot of um, gabbing about where these guys came from be or where the people in the story and Andy really embraced that he, he was not shy about yeah I'm, I'm ready to go make a Don Siegel movie yeah, yeah I love that the stripped down approach and I love that it's also intimately linked to the Fassbender character's point of view and Ren I'm wondering for you from a sound design perspective how that affects your job because I thought you did a lot of really really interesting things with point of view in this movie Oh, it's, it's, it's in, well, thank you for saying that. Um, as far as ideas, the ideas, some of them actually came in the script when we were working on Seven, just because we're talking about the writer, Andy Kevin Walker, he sometimes will write sound in the script, and that's a great place to start from. Not always, but, but you know, he will. And the scene with Somerset in the, in the opening act with the metronome, he wrote, but he's hearing out the window. He even wrote music cues in the script in the, uh, in the library sequence. It's the box here on the G-string. So, but with this film, I think that a lot of it came from the actual voiceover itself and how the Kirk Baxter and David, when they were shaping the cut and trying to find in the film and discover the rhythm of the voice which led to a rhythm of how the music, the Smiths would be cut, which was then helping discover the sort of vertical sound that David was hoping to get. That was all part of a wonderful, really cool process. Uh, he's, being, he, he's being incredibly modest. Because, and one of the reasons that I wanted to have Ren here tonight is because like, you can just ice a cake, you know? Like, sound is often used as like spackle or to just fill cracks and, and to make things smooth. Um, but we tasked him and he more than provided like a, a whole storytelling adjunct to it, which was we actually make you, I mean, there's almost nothing about the shot, reverse shot, you know, how, how you structure the POVs that, that gives you the sense of, 
um, uh, intense subjectivity, we actually ended up having to go to sound to make that point and to make that point, you know, extremely concretely and reiterate and reiterate and reiterate so that people, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times his what his internal monologue gets interrupted by something that's happening in, in front of him. But those kinds of ideas were like, you know, in the in the wrong hands would suck. <laughs> Well, you know, the internal monologue thing, I mean, that kind of voiceover narration, it seems simple to people, but it can, you know, where you have the mic, how you mix it, how, what you add to it can all, you know, affect it's all, it. It's also like, but the question, I think there's a bigger question, which is when we hear sushi, home fish, that's what my ex-wife calls me, or Saigon, shit, I'm still only in Saigon, um, the, the, the way that that informs what it is that's going on is the way that the audience understands the VO, the existence of any VO is this is the truth, right? This because this why would this guy lie? Why would he be unreliable to himself? And yet, most of the people I know are lying to themselves. So, so I just thought that was kind of an interesting. Um, Way in. Well, Ryan, can you talk a little bit about your approach to the VO and to uh, you know how you recorded it, how you mixed it? Yeah, sure. Um, it was great because David and Kurt kind of arrived at a place where they were willing to go. Okay, we feel we think this is good. Let's see what we can do next. And they've already, they already established some really cool rules, as I'm sure everybody noticed. Where when you are looking through the killer's eyes, you don't hear him speak, but when you are looking at him, you hear him. And that was a, a fun rule to establish that Kurt found with David in the cutting room. And then from that, that led to, well, what else can we make vertical? Well, what about the music? What about the earbuds? What about the Smiths? What about when he's looking through the gun? How soon is now is loud only when it's his POV, but then when we're on him, it sounds small as with the correct perspective. So those were the, sort of the stepping points, those are sort of, the, sort of the, the guidelines by which then we then got into the fine design of it and the fine cutting of it to then create all the cuts. And as David was saying a moment ago, which was really, you know, he was saying it, and it's true, like when we as sound artists and editors, we try to smooth the sound, kind of like music so that it's this horizontal element to the film because the picture cuts are vertical and when they happen they can be kind of weird if they're, if they're not done properly you can pay attention to a picture cut but what was interesting about david's approach and how he pushed us was to say what if we drew attention to those sound cuts what if we made a point of having the audience be aware that it's Sonically cutty. There's an antecedent for this, and the antecedent for this is like the old Oricons, or even like CBS, you know, even 60 Minutes in the 60s. You know, they would film with with cameras that had microphones on the on the top of the camera, and so whatever direction the camera was pointed in, it exas exacerbated the sound that was behind whatever the character. And so you be it became kind of. Part the subtext of it was that it becomes documentary. And and so we wanted to exploit that. We had talked about doing that years ago on Fight Club, but because the, the movie was two hours and 28 minutes or something, it was exhausting. So we thought if we could keep the movie short enough that we could tax the audience's ears relentlessly, and they would forget us. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that sort of leads me to another question about the movie structure. I love the, you know, the chapter headings and the way, you know, the sort of different shifts the movie takes. Was that structure always built into the script, or was it something you discovered in an editorial somewhere? It was, it was something I broached to, to Andy, and we talked about the idea of, like, why, why can't you have five 20-minute blocks, you know, and, and the as it turns out, because 
first acts are just fucking longer, and and you have to let that stuff spill over the edge. We did the best we could, but but I but I was like, if the intention is within the confines of this black or white, you know, spot on the chessboard, if if the idea is to to explore that in terms of subtext and 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 text, there's no reason why. The setup needs to take longer, except of course that does. But um, but we were we were t attempting to 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 play with that notion that you could um, you know we originally had a much longer um, epilogue, and um, but we ended up trimming that back and making it even tighter. But it's really all in service of trying to deliver this experience that is you know literally plucking the audience's eye out of their head and sticking it in the eye socket of of Michael Fassbender and experiencing everything that he experiences as he's experiencing it. Um, where did the idea come from to use the pseudonyms, you know, named after TV stars or TV yeah. characters? That's Andy. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, too much TV. <laughs> a, a waste of you. I mean, <laughs> and Ren, you brought up the Smith songs. I was curious how you guys landed on that as the stuff that Fassbender's character listens to. And were there other songs that you thought about or tried out? Or yeah, you know, it was it was great because David uh, he he knew he wanted How Soon Is Now. That was that was the one track that he knew he wanted. And then from there... I thought it was funny, the idea that this is this guy's song that he goes to to kind of meditate to. Which is sort of saying, like, now we're, we're teeing him up to be a little left of center. And But then the rest of it was sort of an open canvas, and there were a lot of, a lot of people that helped uh, with ideas, including the, our composers who chimed in with ideas. And then... That there was a point where there was a Johann Sebastian Bach version, there was a Mozart version, and that's to Springfield, <laughs> right? That's to Springfield. Very cool. <laughs> and it, and one of the things that we enjoyed so much about trying different music for the his his source cues in his iPod was that we realized, you know, the character he doesn't even have a name. We don't know who he is. He barely speaks on camera, of course we hear his interior monologue. So we don't really know much about him, so to kind of inform the audience something quirky or strange was all of a sudden like, there's an opportunity here, and that's how the Smiths came about. It also was a, 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 a byproduct of, we had a very disparate um, potpourri of, of uh, you know, we had Joy Division, and we, we did a version of Susie and the Banshees. We did one, you know, it's basically like Matt Pinfield's like fucking playlist. But, <laughs> but it was, um, but it, as songs fell out, we would just replace them with the Smiths. And it was always like, no, oh, that's so much better. Let's just do it. <laughs> Except the Commissar, that was, uh, that that's was almost day though. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the actual score, what kinds of conversations did you have about the guiding principles for the music with Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross? Um, well, look, we're lucky enough to work with them, so we, we do nothing to upset the apple cart there. They, they're um, a, an extremely uh, specific um, tandem, and the way that they work is... Um, I've never worked this way before, but I prefer it over like, I need 18 feet, 13 frames of music. Like I just, I don't like the idea of going to anybody and, and ordering up music in feet and frames. So what we normally do with them since social network is kind of give them the vibe of the movie, let them read the script, show them dailies and or cut, cut sequences, and then they react and Usually, they go away for eight to ten days, and then they inundate you with like a tsunami of different ways that you could go. And and what was especially one one of the things that we had to prescribe in this was there's so much voiceover, and we knew that even with the microphone exactly where we wanted it to be for Michael, he would still sort of operate like his vocal register would kind of be in the mid-range. So we, I kind of said to them, you guys can have all the subs and all the tweeters, and 
we got to take the rest of it. And so they sent us about, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes with the music the first time. And the stuff that we gravitated toward, we, we cut in and we sent it back to them. And it was Atticus who, who I, it was either on the phone, maybe it was on the phone, maybe it was an email, but he was like, oh, you're going for all the weird stuff. <laughs> so I was like, when Atticus tells you that, like you're on the right track. So, so that's how it kind of came. Um, well, I'm going to open up the audience in a minute, but first, Ren, I got to ask about the fight sequence in Florida because you're watching that in this theater with the audience. You're hearing it. Your sound works in that scene is incredible. I mean, like, just, and, and I'm really curious to hear you guys talk about hatists. Just hatists. Uh, I'm really curious to hear you guys talk about like how the decisions were made in terms of like when it's going to be chaotic noise, when it's going to be silent. You know, there's just like it just, it's such a dynamic sound mix in that sequence. Yeah, you know, we had a, it was really um, interesting to work on it because the way that David and, and his cinematographer Eric Messerschmidt shot it was it's very dark, and they created a rule of screen direction where punches would go from right to left, which did, and the reason was that was to sort of and to inform the audience the layout, the architecture of the space, because we have to discover, as we're coming into the space, we have to know, we are identifying with the killer, like where is the brute, this incredibly scary guy that's gonna, and he, I guess he's in the shower, and he's listening to uh, a Home and Garden show, Village Road Show, which is <laughs> hilarious, by the way. Antiques Road Show. Antiques, sorry, Antique Road Show, sorry. <laughs> And, uh, and then he's blowing and drying his hair. So the way it was filmed and the way that we ent or first entered the sequence is all visual, but with sound following the visual. So he hears something off to the left, he, he, or to the right. We, we hear him turning off the, the shower. We hear him walking away. And then, of course, the big surprise is that the brute knows he's there. Because when he first came in, there's those beeps that inform us that, ah, oh, maybe that. Maybe he heard me, but no, maybe he didn't hear me. And uh, even his voiceover, the killer's voiceover gets interrupted when the brute fools the killer with his hair dryer, puts it down, and circles around. And so from that point, it was a story of a lot of sound editing and a lot of precision and a lot of direction from David, which was super fun because visually, it's, there's a lot going on. And sometimes you don't see what's happening, but you can hear it. So that was a nice way to kind of hand off between. Uh, it seemed like it would be scarier in the dark. It just seemed like it, yeah. it would be instead. Do you really need to know who everyone is all the time? <laughs> right. So from there, it was it, that then it started a great rhythm. And then David was obsessed with the scale of these two killers because he knew one fellow was massive, the brute, and then our hero, the killer, was. A slender man who could do yoga was what 155 pounds, right? He, he he drives a race car, so he's very particular about his weight. He's 145 pounds. Excuse me, 145 pounds. <laughs> Six feet tall. So, scaling of character in size and darkness was important to David. That one felt heavier and menacing. So all those elements were really helpful direction for us in terms of sound, and then also just. The, the very beginning of the sequence, the gun gets dropped. So as we're traversing through the, 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 the home, we have to sort of know where we are because the killer has to know where that gun is. In the end. So there's a lot of, and if you watch it again, you'll notice those, those cues where we're, we're slowly circling back to where the gun is. Um, all to say that it was, it was a sequence that we, we spent a lot of time on. Uh, and David was, one of the things that was important to him is he didn't want to hear vocalizations. So there's a few grunts, but for the most part, these are highly trained assassins who don't make sounds with their voices, which is unusual in a film. By the way, right? when we shot it, you know, they were grunting and screaming and, you know, making all kinds of noise. And then when we took it out and I would play them the dailies and go, okay, this is what it's going to sound like. And they were like, it's so weird because normally they get to do all that. Like, kind of, and now it's sort of like, you know, and doing real damage, but um, yeah, it seems like it would be interesting. Cool. Well, I'm going to open it up to the audience. I think there are a couple of mics out there, so raise your hands, and if you have a question, somebody will uh, bring you a mic. 
How about this, Steve? Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Testing, testing. Hey, a uh, huge fan of the comic book, and I was blown away by how this turned out. Like, and I just, <laughs> I'm speechless about it. It's incredible. And uh, my question is, fan of the comic book, hate this movie. <laughs> What is your major malfunction? <laughs> what was the hardest part of making the journey from optioning the book to shooting the movie? What part took the longest to adapt or break down or anything like that? Oh, good God. Um, um, I don't know. Look, you know, I know that there's this need for journalists and, and people who write about film to hear like what was the most difficult thing um, it's all fucking hard um, <laughs> you know, getting the money to do it and then shooting in the Dominican Republic and then in the middle of a pandemic where everybody's in the Andromeda strain and we're all trying to like <laughs> fucking talk to each other it was all hard but yet that's what you get paid to do so you do the best you can and you try to live it down um, I don't know it was the, the hardest part I think was um, of the development process was getting to the script that people could see was, you know, art house enough to be interesting and enough of a fastball to that you could kind of say, we think there'll be an audience for this. And, you know, it was the amalgam. So finding the, the balance where it was mean enough to interest me and tame enough to... Uh, be on a streaming service. <laughs> hey, oh, no, don't take it off. Give it a second. Right. Hello? I can say it. Um, it's on. Oh, it's on. Hey, uh, love the movie, huge fan of the comics. Love, love your work, but uh, two guys who are huge fans of this comic. <laughs> I, I actually work in comic books. I'm a comic book editor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but I, I'm, I'm curious, curious uh, you know, know, there's a lot of comics in this, in this series. Have you, do you feel you've said everything you need to say with this character? Or is it something you hear yourself maybe coming back to? We have very interesting ideas for the future, he lied. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, God damn it. Okay. Welcome. Uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the film very much. I, I, I love anything tactical. Uh, probably the thing that I love most are imperfections and small details that would occur in a situation that would make it a little bit more organic. Um, I just wanted to say that, I, yeah, I just, I, I thought this was a fresh take on that approach. Uh, just that he, he makes a major mistake in the beginning. He's pretty regimented all the way through. There's a couple mistakes here and there, but for the most part, he does stick to the plan. Uh, was this something that, is this a response to other forms of action that you've seen? I mean, obviously adding the part where they're not grunting as much. Uh, and also on a sound design level, I love the tinnitus elements of uh, some of the scenes as well. Uh, big fan, huge success, I'm very happy with this. I'm going to let you answer that one. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, okay. no, uh, well, the tin thank you for noticing those the tinnitus. We, uh, we, we, I'm cursed with, so I have it all the time, but it's actually in there. You have the yeah, we have the tinnitus in there. Yeah, we had actually at one point all there. We had it more often, uh, and it was sort of a an idea that you know he, he the killer it was mostly in in the pair sequence, but he would he could anticipate his watch going off and and there would be a sound there that would cue him and in the first few moments he wouldn't notice and it was all the it was the idea of it was just to sort of inform us in an an abstract way of his sense of precision and time that he could actually wake up and then the clock would go, that he would, his internal clock was so precise. So I appreciate you actually noticing that. Great, thank you all for staying. Yeah, so this is my uh, second time watching the film and I found that uh, through, I, 
This is a lot of like of course of, <laughs> the, the uh, whole course of the uh, film, I feel like there's like, you know, in terms of like a film, you have like the meat and then you have like the veggies. And I feel like in terms of like the more like meditative at the beginning and then towards like the tail end when we have like Tilda Swinton just like killing it and then also at the very end as well. Uh, I found like those like more like meditative kind of like talking conversations to be like a, more, a bit more like fruitful and I feel like telling a lot more of like the characters like identity and I, I guess I, I was a bit curious in terms of like creating that sort of like process of like what it was like in terms of like giving life to those scenes that were like a bit more like low key and you know uh, I mean we're more fortunate in terms of like watching it in a theater but like in terms of like watching it at home and even in the theater to a certain degree as well for general audiences, how that's like in terms of like formulating that for entertainment. I'm not sure I got it. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, um, we basically had the task of having um, six Bernie Baum bomb scenes, right? So in, in Miller's Crossing, um, um, Gabriel Byrne takes John Turturro out in the woods to shoot him, and we had basically six of those. So the idea was, how do we make all of them, somebody making a case for their lives, interesting, and how do we make them all distinctly different from one another? So that was kind of the job at hand, is like, you go, it's basically the same thing, you're taking somebody out to the woodshed who's not coming back, and how are they going to make a case for themselves? Now, that may not be enough drama to hang a whole movie on, but out of belligerence, I convinced Andy that it was. And he came back with some writing that seemed to say, yeah, we, if we keep it in this kind of realm and stay this focused on these elements, this could be mistaken for a story. <laughs> Yeah, you have to stand up. Sorry. Yes. Um, love the movie. Never read the comic. Um, I was curious. You meet this guy. I know. I'll talk to him. After. I was curious. There's a lot of technology, and it feels very modern with the use of like Amazon and the way that he is very dialed into society. Was that something that you talked to Andy when making the movie, or is that something? Yeah. Really no. Hard? He came up with that, and and it's. You know, it was incredibly informative and kind of the gift to the movie in that it sparked all kinds of different conversations. Um, uh, like, for instance, we were looking for a space that made sense that this guy could spend six days sleeping on sheetrock waiting for somebody. And I was like, what if it's WeWork space? And I was like, okay. Um, again, not like the most satirical um, take on it, but ju it just seemed to make kind of sense. May they rest in peace. Um, <laughs> um, obviously, there was a whole, um, there was an entire sequence, I think it was like two or three pages, where he goes and copies the, the, um, the client's uh, pass key that let, lets him into the house. And um, I called Andrew one day and I just said, there's got to be a fob copy, RFID copier that exists that you could buy. And, and he was like, Dave, if that existed, no one would ever accept a room key at a hotel without like, I was like, just do a little bit of research. 11 seconds later, he sends me ostensibly the same, the same like, you know, screen grab that we use in the movies. And it's like, holy fuck, for $29. We will send this shit to your home with sweets. <laughs> you know, so we, we just, it's not about, um, it's not a screed on technology. It's about, um, in a, I understand how James Bond gets through the world. He has bazillions of dollars behind him and an entire, like, you know, security infrastructure to help him at every turn. Our guy's a little different, he's flying coach, and, um, and he's putting his entire wardrobe together as he walks through an airport, you know, stopping at Skechers, and then, um, so we wanted it to, we wanted him to avail himself, not of technologies for the sake of technology, but for, we wanted to, him to avail himself of technologies that allow for us to move through the world without making eye contact with anybody else. 
And so when we looked originally in the script, it was the McDonald's on Champs-Élysées that serves 250,000 cheeseburgers a day. And it was a good location. They were never gonna let us fucking shoot there. But on our way to that location, we, brought, we drove past another one that was a McDonald's that you could order on your phone. And there was a window in the wall that somebody hands a bag of burgers out to you. And I was like, that's what we're talking about. So I mean, it wasn't so much about like, um, you know, fuck Jeff Bezos. It was, it was, it was like, can you avail yourself of the technology that would make this um, easier? Well, unfortunately, I'm getting the sign that it's time to wrap up, I think. So uh, I'd like to point out Carrie O'Malley, who's, who's back here, who is who's not really able to Thank you, Gary. Well, I can't think of a better movie to kick off the new Restored Egyptian with, so thank you guys so much for coming.